Father, we love you. And we thank you, Holy Spirit, for this time we have together. So grateful for the graduates and, and our friends who are watching on Facebook and uh, whatever platform they're watching from. And pray, God, that you would open our hearts and speak to us tonight. And Lord, that you would condition our hearts towards the direction and in, in, in the direction in which your wind is blowing. That we would only go where the wind is blowing. That we would not be taken aside to any other direction, any other position or posture that would keep us from being just sails in your presence, God. We lift up our sails before you and we say, God, breathe on us and breathe into us, Holy Spirit, and take us where you're leading your church, your body, because we want to go with you and we want to be caught up with you in this move of your spirit and not be lagging behind, not be paying attention to other things or caught up in our own world, but we want to be caught up in your presence. So that's what we want, God. We thank you for fresh Pentecost in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want to talk to you guys about the difference between pioneers and settlers. So a pioneer is someone who kind of goes before others, like in a wilderness setting, you know, we would tend to think of, you know, when the, when the people came from Europe to America, they came to the East Coast near the New York, uh, Connecticut area. And, and, you know, there were mostly American Indians here, but it was a, it was a new land. They were pioneers. They were you know, there was nothing established here except those who were living here. But as far as like infrastructure and education and food sources and things like that, like they had prepared in Europe, there was none of that here. And so they went in a wilderness setting. You know, John the Baptist could be viewed as a, a pioneer, one who uh, went into the wilderness to preach the the, the soon coming of the Lord, the Messiah. And pioneers prepare the way for others to follow. And settlers are those who settle in a new location and they make an un, a, maybe a previously uninhabited place as their home. Now, as I'm talking about pioneers and settlers, I'm not talking about the difference between missionaries and pastors or apostles and you know any other gift that would be viewed as a local church body gift uh, i'm not talking about that only i'm actually talking about that the church of jesus christ is called to be pioneers in this world and we will be settlers when we get to heaven so a lot of people think you know, I want to, you know, I, I get saved. I, the Lord changes my life. And now I want to be a settler. I want to establish something. Uh, I want to build my house. I want to build my family. You know? and, and, and yes, that's important. That's valuable. But there's something about the church that when, when Jesus breathed upon the church and the Holy Spirit was poured out on the day of Pentecost, then he said, you must go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the earth. And so there was this progression that Jesus promoted even before Pentecost was poured out. And then we see how the church did start in Jerusalem, went to Judea, Samaria. And in Paul's missionary journeys, he ended up in what we now call as Europe. And he died there in Italy. And, and so... I believe that the church oftentimes gives into settling more than we value our pioneer calling. So, you know, settling without pioneering keeps us from inheriting the promises of God in the next life. Because if we're so focused on this world and what we can attain here, we oftentimes lose sight of our pioneer call as being Christians, disciples of Jesus. Look, not all settling is bad. I'm not saying it's wrong to own a house. 
I'm not saying it's wrong, you know, to be in one place and minister there. I'm not saying we always just have to be fidgety and moving. It depends on what God's called you to be, uh, where God's called you to be. But we should have a consistent pioneering spirit within us that never stops the sense of the movement of the spirit. We never want to quench the Holy Spirit by settling in this world and becoming more like the world than we are looking like the kingdom of heaven. Because you and I know when we're born again, we immediately become citizens of heaven. We're no longer, you know, of this world anymore, but we still live in this world. So the challenge is, how do I live as a pioneer wherever God calls me to settle? And where I'm settling, am I allowing that pioneering spirit to mature and to grow? And I feel like this is the power, the gift, the purpose of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is to cause the church to be consistently awake and renewed to the revelation of Jesus, to the revelation of his soon coming, that we would, whether he's coming in uh, a year or a thousand years from now, we are to live on the edge with God and live in a place of readiness so that we would never stop the flow and the movement of the river of God that's coming from heaven and flowing through us. You know, whatever we gain in this life, we must be willing to lose in the next life. So another reason that we should not just focus on settling in this life, but continue to cultivate that pioneering spirit is that whatever we have should not have us, should not control us. Again, it's not bad to have things, but we must never let things have us, right? We've heard that many times. You know, in the church, there's different gifts. But in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 12, specifically in verse 7, Paul says that all gifts are given for the common good. So that it's not like one gift is more important than others. All play an important role. Uh, and gifts are not about the individual. They should all point the world and everything to Jesus. So whatever God's gifted you to do, whether it's to be in front or behind the scenes or, you know, some capacity of serving people that we should always make it focus on the Lord, right? So if what we are doing as far, far as gift and calling does not draw us closer to God, then it doesn't matter. It's not important. We mustn't try to make ourselves great in this life, but cultivate that pioneer spirit that always says, this is all about Jesus. And so we need to keep the praise, the adoration, the honor towards him and keeping people motivated, moving in a direction of knowing Jesus, being intimate with the Lord, following through with their calling and purpose and fulfilling the Great Commission. You know, whether you are called to a pastoral ministry or like an evangelist of some sort uh, or a teacher or a prophetic role, whatever, or none of those fivefold gifts, but some other gifts, right? We must all see ourselves as being apostolic. Now, I'm not saying that everybody is an apostle. But when Jesus sent out his disciples and gave them the Great Commission, he sent them out. So there is a general calling, an apostolic calling authority upon the church, the body of Christ, to be uh, uh, an apostolic means to be sent out. So we're not just focused on the title or the Ephesians 4.11 gift of an apostle, as much as we're talking about the, 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 the overall apostleship of the body of Christ. We are sent out. We are called to go. And so we're called to go where? To take the gospel to every nation, tribe, and tongue, right? To the Jew first and then to the Gentile. When, and listen to this. Whenever the church stops moving, 
and we begin to become settlers, instead of focusing on our pioneering calling, we lose sight of our apostolic foundations. And that's why many times churches stop growing. And, and look, you can go to some places and labor in a certain area for years and see very little fruit. But if, if the ones who are called to pioneer a work stop pursuing prayer, stop pursuing the presence of God, stop pursuing fasting and stuff, and they just kind of settle and they say, well, let's rent a building and let's get people to come to where we're at. You know, you're never going to grow a ministry or work like that. We must always have a certain amount of activity on our lives that comes from a place of rest, sonship, intimacy with God, so that we remain full in our, in our uh, identity and, and the power of the Holy Spirit so that, you know, we don't allow what's happening in front of us, whether it be bearing fruit or not in a moment, to determine if I'm going to stop being pioneering and, and begin to become more of a settler. I hope that makes sense. But not everyone is an apostle. But listen, because in Hebrews 3.11, it says, or 3.1, it says that Jesus is our great apostle. So that means if Jesus is the great apostle, and we are a part of the body of Christ, and we are to look like him, Again, not everybody is called to be an apostle, prophet, pastor, teacher, evangelist, or some other unique gift in the body, but we are all called to a general apostleship, apostolic authority that is to have this pioneering grace upon us. Everything we do as disciples of Jesus must value, uh, must value Jesus and have the characteristics of him his apostolic authority. So we are to look like Jesus, right? We are to not replace and be Jesus, but to look like him. You know, in uh, Ephesians 4.11, we know this very well. You know, he, he, Jesus, after he died, rose again, ascended to heaven. As he's ascending to heaven, he gave some to be apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, and evangelists for the purpose of equipping the church uh, to build up the body of Christ, right? So that we would all come to a place of unity of the faith and of the spirit. And we would walk in our apostolic calling and role. So again, I don't know what part of the body you might be, seen or unseen, but remember this is that Jesus started with 12 apostles. He didn't start with 12 pastors, 12 teachers, 12 evangelists, 12, uh, you know, whatever uh, gift there is. He started with 12 apostles because there's something about the church understanding its apostleship so that we would continue to pioneer and take ground, whether that be spiritual ground or actual land and territory for the kingdom of God. Uh, if, if we forget our apostolic um, calling and identity, we will undervalue what God wants us to value. And we will begin to place the church to look like something that we're familiar with and that others have taught us while settling in in this life and stop having uh, influence in the world. I think Whenever the church is losing its influence in the world and, and, and whether it be persecuted or not, and we settle in because of there's maybe no so little suffering or no persecution, we start to feel like, oh, you know, I'm okay. But I feel like through this whole COVID situation, people are being drawn back in to a place of, uh, you know, being right with God and, and recognizing that. Um, we have to get back to our roots. We have to get back to understand that no matter if I'm called to work this job or be a teacher here or a pastor in the mountains or, you know, a prophet to the nations, no matter what I'm doing, I have an apostolic responsibility. We have thrown these words around and made them to sound like bad words and be 
because everybody nowadays wants to be called an apostle. I'm not calling everybody an apostle. I'm saying the church of Jesus Christ is apostolic. And this apostolic authority that God has called us to live in, to move in, to respond to the world in will help us see the breakthroughs that, that they saw in the early church. So remember this, you can look at some of these scriptures later, Ephesians 2, 19 to 22, 1 Peter 2, 4 through 8. It talks about three things. Number one, Jesus is the cornerstone of the church. Again, the cornerstone is the first stone laid when you're going to establish a foundation. Then he says, apostles, prophets, and teachers are the foundation of the church, the cement foundation. And then the rest of the body of Christ are called living stones being built upon one another. So that is what a picture of what the body of Christ is supposed to look like. And if we see that Jesus is the great apostle and that the foundation is laid upon apostles, prophets, right, teachers, then the, the, the building of, of the body of Christ should continue to have an apostolic identity. What makes something apostolic? Well, I mean, if you look at the life of Paul, they endure suffering and affliction. They, 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 they see, often see signs, wonders, miracles, healing, and they, they take the gospel to people who may have never heard, and they, they're servants. They're people who press through things, and they don't love their lives even unto death. They say, it's all about Jesus. It's not about me. I am not going to allow whatever situations are coming against me in my life to keep me from pursuing and fulfilling the purpose, the apostolic purposes of God upon his body. You and I should feel a great responsibility to make sure that the church of Jesus Christ in my own personal responsibility is vibrant, is healthy, and is moving forward. Now, I was reading in Numbers 32 this past week. And in Numbers 32, it talks about uh, Israel is at the Jordan River, and they're, they're on their way there, and they're about to cross over. So when they left Egypt, they kind of went south and then crossed over, uh, right, the Red Sea, and then they came up into the lands of, I guess it's probably I, Iran, and, and then, uh, or not, not Iran, I, just maybe south of Iraq, I, I don't know, I don't have a map in front of me. And then they were supposed to go east and cross over the Jordan River, which came down, and then in, on the other side of the Jordan River, on the east side, was the land of Canaan. And that was the promised land. So when Israel in Numbers 32 is going in, the, there's three tribes, um, uh, Reuben, Gad, and the half tribe of Manasseh, they saw how the land before the Jordan River, the west side of the river, not the east side where God said the promised land is, the west side was this beautiful piece of land where they thought, well, we have all this um, uh, livestock, right? Cattle and goats and, you know, sheep. And, and we can settle here. They, listen guys, they were slaves in Egypt for 400 years. God delivers them. He takes them and leads them with, with a cloud by day, fire by night through the Red Sea. And they wander in the wilderness for 40 years. And they were supposed to only take less than two weeks to get from Egypt to the promised land. But they took the long route instead of just taking the route God had. And they wandered in the wilderness 40 years. They get to the edge of the Jordan River. And now these three tribes and all that they went through, they say, you know what? We, Moses, don't really want to go into the land of Canaan because we like this property here. And they wanted to abide there. 
And so this troubled Moses, and I'm kind of summarizing that chapter just to save time. And I would encourage you to read that chapter for yourself later. And as they, let, let, I'm going to go through some of it just real quickly. You know, um, they said to Moses all these things. And, and he says, look, when we get into Canaan, we're, we're going to be going to war against some people. God told us this is going to happen, but we are a united Israel. So if you want some land outside of the promised land that God has promised to us, then you know what? You still have to fight with us. And so that's the condition. It seems like God allows Gad, Reuben, the half tribe of Manasseh to cause that land to be of their inheritance. Then the rest of the promised land, God has Moses and the priest to, to, um, to split up the land for the other tribes, right? Caleb also got his allotment and, and, and different ones. And so, you know, you, you, you think about that. Moses says, you got to still fight with us. And I say, okay, we'll agree with you because we really want this land. And you can read through this chapter on your own. And you'll see that Moses is like, man, I, I don't like this. But you, as long as you fight with us, it seems like God says it's okay. You know, I, I, I wondered how the Lord would actually feel. What, you know, sometimes we're so concerned about, you know, what's going to happen in my life and where I'm headed and how successful where, will my family be and things like that. But we're not so concerned about where God is wanting us to go. And even though he outlined everything for Israel and said, you need to go to this promised land, they continued to not, some of them not even get into the promised land, but live at the edge because they wanted to settle in. And I, I hope you're feeling this like I am tonight, because I'm telling you that this is, this is really unique. After everything they settled in on that side of the Jordan River in 2 Kings 15 29 it says in the days of Pekah uh, king of Israel Tiglath Pelezar king of Assyria came and took Ejon Abel Beth Makkah Janoa uh, Kadesh Hazor Gilead and Galilee and all the land of Naphtali, and he carried them captive to Israel to Assyria. You know what that means? Is that be, and this was a, a, a long period of time after these guys settled in, you know, God, Reuben, and the half tribe of Manasseh settled in. Is that what happened because they were not in the land of Canaan where God told them to be? They were supposed, all the 12 tribes of Israel were supposed to be surrounded about Jerusalem, right? Where the tabernacle, the temple was to be established. And that was the purpose. That was the goal. That was the calling. But these guys stay farther out. And, and, and what happens? They become susceptible to attack. God allowed them to settle in although he still said, I want you to be pioneers. And so they settled in and then what happens? They were already set free from slavery from Egypt and now they get all the way to the line, the Jordan River, where if they just had crossed over, they would not have been attacked and by themselves and they were taken as slaves to Assyria. They escaped slavery to go to the line of the promised land and never cross that line only to be made slaves once again. Friend, when I read that, oh, that broke my heart because I feel like there's so many people that say, Jesus, I will follow you wherever you want me to go. But Lord, as I've been walking with you these months and these years, I found this land. I found this place of 
settling in. And if you'll allow me to have this place, then I'll still live for you there. And you know, the Lord is so gracious and good. And he gives us oftentimes the desire of our heart, even if our desires don't line up with his will. He's so patient, slow to anger, abounding in love. And, and I'm sure that he's always praying for us that we would make the decisions that would not only benefit ourselves, but continue his kingdom purposes to be sent out. So the Reubenites and Gadites reap slavery instead of inheriting God's blessing. Although God blessed them, gave them the property and, and stuff like that, there was still an ounce of disobedience that kept them from why go 99% and not go the one last percent? Why go 99 miles or kilometers and not go that last kilometer? Look, I understand that things get hard and difficult, but listen, right now, I'm telling you, apostolic authority is coming back upon the church. Apostolic power is coming upon the body. People are praying. People are fasting. People are seeking God for revival and awakening. I see things, people getting stirred up here in America. And I want to tell you, in the Philippines, I, I got to encourage you guys, no matter where you are, where you're watching this right now, Get stirred up in the Holy Ghost. Stay in that place of being ready. The church must continue its apostolic and pioneering calling until one day we become settlers in heaven. So let me get into a practical side of this and, and then we'll, we'll finish up. The other day, uh, uh, maybe some of you saw it online, we posted pictures and a video and everything. Uh, our daughter, Abigail, 18 years old, we had a, a graduation for her. And she was, um, uh, obviously she's homeschooled. So there was another young lady at the church we're at right now in Florida who's been homeschooled uh, her whole life. And they uh, did a graduation together. It was so beautiful. And their family, our family came together, people from the church and we did a live feed on, on Facebook, and, and so it was so beautiful, so encouraging. So there's something so unique about Abby that when she was born, she was born two months before we left to the Philippines, and now it seems like after we've been in the States this long that there is a new shift of what God's doing. And she's going to school and, and uh, college in uh, August. But I feel like our role is transitioning in the Philippines. Now, hear me. I didn't say we're leaving the Philippines. What I said is that we're transitioning. And I want you guys, I want you grads, I want folks to hear, because I believe some of this practical insight is going to be an encouragement to you of where things are transitioning. While I was up there and giving testimony and sharing about Abby and, and a word that the Lord gave me for her, I felt I was supposed to go up. She was sitting down in the chair, go up behind her, put my hands on her back. And I, as I began to pray for her, these words came out of, out of my mouth. I said, for 18 years, Abby, the Lord has allowed Casey and I the opportunity to lead you, to be in front of of you. Now I believe the Lord desires us to get behind you and to hold up your arms. As I said that, I felt like it was a word for our work in the Philippines. That, again, I don't believe our time is done in the Philippines, but I believe our role is changing for a good reason. I'm looking at some of you graduates right now. You guys are all doing ministry in different capacities. I, and it doesn't matter to me what it looks like, how successful it is. I just know that you are laborers who have your hands to the plow. I believe a time has come for us to get behind you guys and help hold up your arms. 
There, you have heard us teach about revival missions for years. And what I am excited about is that I believe a baton is being passed to you guys and a new sense of leadership is coming upon you. And, and this is for anybody who's watching here, not just for our grads. I believe there's a fresh sense of authority and grace coming upon you for you to rise up and to, and, and some of you are already doing these things, but to move forward in the purposes of God for your life. Now, um, recently I talked to Pauline and we felt the both of us that we are to put on hold the rest of this year, fire school of ministry. And at the same time, we have had a desire. I've had a desire. And then Pauline came to me without knowing it was a desire in my heart to say, hey, we would like to do some type of a junior fire school of ministry for the youth, the young people who've been coming to burn. I was thrilled to hear that because I feel like there is a transition that's taking place. I think we're still going to have fire school. I just think that uh, some of the things that we're going to see happen are going to shift and that we're called to raise up this generation uh, of young people. The other thing is um, we feel like the Lord is telling us to give up our home in the Philippines. Um, we're going we're gonna to have Pauline help start packing up the house. And what we're going to do is get a smaller apartment for uh, Pauline to live in and then kind of shove all of our stuff in there until we're able to get back. And we feel like we're supposed to not be renting anymore, but that we're supposed to be having something that we can come to and from as we travel and stuff. And I, I'm not going to give too many details because we're still praying through some things, but I'm excited about this because it's going to release finances for us to be able to do longer term things. Something that, that the Lord's really spoken to us about for some years now, but even more intensely this past year, is about the need to own property. And not because we, you know, for wealth or settling purposes, but for the purpose of helping a pioneering work go farther. And so one of the things we want to do is stop renting and start, and, and look, we don't have the money right now or anything like that. We're stepping out in faith. We're saying, Lord, we want, we want to follow you no matter what you're saying and doing and, and give it up so that, look, we've been, uh, we've been homeless for like the last year. <laughs> and I want to tell you, God has been so faithful, guys. In fact, we have a home here that we're staying at next door to a church in Florida that um, they've given us and gave us the key that, hey, you guys use this and come and go as you need to. And so we've been able to stay some periods longer than others. But, you know, we, we recently went to Hawaii. We were there. Somebody gave us a place to stay there while we were there. It was real small. We're in Dothan, Alabama, staying in a small, like, trailer RV setting. We stayed with different people. Uh, we, I, I mean, it, it's, it's been wild year. I mean, we've never traveled so much in that past year and like three months as we have, you know, ever. But we're pioneers. We are not settlers. And you guys are pioneers. And again, I'm not telling you, you just have to move somewhere and stop doing what you're doing. That's, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying for you to think about what this message and what God is speaking to you. I'm hoping that you're taking notes on this and writing down and going to the Lord in prayer and saying, Lord, what are you speaking? Because I want to move forward and be, you know, a part of this apostolic church that you birthed uh, over 2000 years ago. So I believe God's calling us move out of that home into more of a promised land type of 
situation. I want to cross the Jordan. I don't want to live on the right side of the Jordan, on the east side or the west side. Uh, I want to, yeah, the east side of the Jordan. I want to live on the west side of the Jordan. I want to go into what God's called us to do, all of us to do. Um, as far as the building, we're going to keep the building for now and just see what the Lord says. We have no uh, details about that. Um, uh, in fact, I think Maranatha is going to start using it more as a church. And so we're excited about that. And the feeding program is still going on and burn is going on. So all of that is continuing. Uh, but I believe we're just coming into a new phase uh, of, of things. So I, I'm going to ask that you guys would pray with us for God to supply these needs. And because, look, my goal is to be not, uh, out, we don't have any debt. We don't want to be, you know, paying rent. I want to free up funds because I want to help people on the mission field. I specifically, we, Casey and I, really feel a call to hold up the arms of our graduates. And that I don't know what that means, guys. You know, um, I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know what it's going to look like. All I know is that the Lord said, get behind, hold up their arms. It's time for us not only to lead, but to help encourage you guys to lead and move forward. And, I, and I'm hearing testimonies from you guys all the time of what you guys are doing. And I'm so blessed. You guys have no idea how blessed Casey and I are when we see your pictures, when we see your videos, when we hear, you know, the stories and the testimonies and we're pressing through, we're praying. Guys, that is exactly what we're talking about. And I want to encourage you guys, please, if you've not done it already, uh, Pauline, if you could send another message in our group chat um, to remind everybody, send Pauline a good photo of you, of your ministry and what you do, and then also uh, just a short uh, synopsis of, of what you do, what your ministry looks like, your heart, and just on a one page. We want to start collecting these and letting people know and hopefully just seeing God connect us with people relationally that will want to support Filipino missionaries. Um, and yeah, uh, that, that's really what's on our heart. Uh, last thing I want to say is, you know, in Acts chapter six, we, we read about, uh, I'm going to just go there really quick. We read about, you know, there were disciples were multiplying and there was a, a, a great growth because some widows were being neglected in the distribution of food. And so the apostles summoned other disciples and said, hey, uh, we need to focus on the word of God and prayer. Um, so we can't just wait on everybody all the time. They said, let's seek out and pray. Find us six good men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit, wisdom, who we can appoint. But we're going to continue to give ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. And it pleased everybody. And then they chose these, these people, these men, and they, and they prayed, laid their hands on them. The apostles did. And then those men began to serve. And then it goes into, at the end of that chapter, and starting in verse 8, it talks about, and into the next chapter, a man named Stephen is raised up. Now, I believe those six men that God chose to wait on the tables, to serve the widows, to make sure they be not overlooked, they had an apostolic authority. But you see God focus immediately on a man named Stephen. Stephen, we know, becomes the first martyr of the church. Stephen continues to pioneer. While they were settling in Jerusalem, Stephen is pioneering. And they were doing good things, but they forgot to kind of go from Jerusalem to Judea. You guys heard me teach on that many times. But I want to encourage you to know that that anointing that was on Stephen in the early church to pioneer and to move forward, it's still on 
the body of Christ. And I want to encourage you to not give up, not pull back. So listen, I'm going to pray right now. And, uh, and just, you know, let's go into a time of maybe some uh, question and answers as well. And maybe things that are stern in your heart like to hear. And anybody who's watching on Facebook too, feel free to interact. Uh, type there on Facebook and we can see your uh, details, your questions, answers. But I'm just going to pray right now. I want to ask you guys, just get in a place to quiet yourself before the Lord. And, and let's, let's just seek him right now. Lord, we know again that this past year has been a, a very unique and different year. And I believe, Holy Spirit, that you are fully in control. There's never been a moment this past year that you haven't been in control. And I believe, God, you are using this time. Though the devil has roared and prowled and sought to destroy your church, God, you have brought us back to a place of humility, of embracing our initial calling as pioneers. And Lord, to help us move forward from settling in, from being in a place of satisfaction while losing that pioneering apostolic edge. God, in Jesus' name, I just release apostolic, a fresh apostolic garment upon us. Lord, that we remind us that we are clothed with power from on high. That we are called to take the gospel to our local and international regions and everywhere in between. That, Lord, we would feel the momentum of the Spirit carrying us, even where we might feel like we've settled in somewhere. That we would feel like we are called to, um, to just fulfill your kingdom purposes and not our own purposes. Father, what an honor it is that you would separate us for yourself and cause us to be a part of your body. You are the great apostle. And even though we're a part of the body and none of us represent all of the body, but just one part, I pray in Jesus' name that whatever part we represent, we would see ourselves as ambassadors of Jesus Christ. And that we would move forward with, with sensing your direction, with the unction of the Holy Spirit upon us. I pray for fresh baptisms of the Holy Spirit. I pray for fresh anointing upon us, God, that we would take the gospel in every direction that you called us to. And that whatever ground that you've, you've given us, I pray for property to be given. I pray for ground to be taken. And not only physical ground, but spiritual ground. Lives and hearts to be taken. Minds to be surrendered to you. Families and churches to be uh, dominated by your presence, God. Lord, regions and villages, God. Mountaintops and valleys. Cities, God. And rural areas, God. Would be gripped with the glory of God. We pray for an awakening and revival that moves us and to the apostolic purposes that you have for our lives. Father, we bless you and we thank you for restoring the image of your church to look like you. In Jesus' name, amen.